Well, hello. I would uh, like to welcome all of you to this podcast where our featured guest is Dr. John Medina. Uh, I'm so excited to have this opportunity. I've known John now for a couple of years. Uh, I've heard him speak, and I have read several of his books, to and including the one that we're going to talk about this morning, which is Brain Rules for Aging Well. I happen to be Michael Eichten. I'm the nostalgic advocate, uh, and my number one cause to advocate for is brain health. And so we have the right person with us today. First of all, thank you, Dr. Medina, for joining us. This is just a real treat for me to have you on this first podcast. You're my first official guest, by the way, and I'm honored. Am I the inaugural ship? Or is this is this the shakedown cruise? No, you are the inaugural. You're going to kick this thing off, and I'm just so excited to have you. Uh, for our listeners that might not know a lot about you or your books, uh, I would like to introduce you to them. Uh, Dr. Medina is a brain scientist. Now, uh, there's an a very long technical term for your official title, Dr. Medina. I would rather you say that than me because I will probably butcher the pronunciation. So what is your official sure. uh, title? Well, my expertise, I'm a developmental molecular biologist, and my research interests are the genetics of psychiatric disorders. So I spend a long time thinking about how the brain develops in the womb, and then what happens when things screw up and years later a psych psychiatric disorder emerges. I've primarily been most of my research life spent as a private consultant, an analytical research consultant, initially to biotech and pharmaceutical industries. I am also an affiliate professor of bioengineering at the University of Washington, which I consider to be my home at in its um, School of Medicine. So that that expertise has allowed me to uh, look at lots of different places, including uh, trying to understand where mythologies can sometimes occur about how the brain processes information. So I ended up also having in my career a public face where I would just write about, well, what is it that we do know about how the brain works, but make it to a lay audience and keep the jargon to a minimum in hopes that both the research side of my life and the public facing side of my life can actually have a connection. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, and we first met, it was actually at the Sun River Resort out in uh, Deschutes, uh, Oregon, not Washington, uh, so not too far from where you uh, actually live. Uh, you stole the show, by the way, at that conference, uh, and, and then I had the opportunity to hear you speak again. Uh, and and actually get to know you a little bit better in person. Uh, just a, a couple of years ago, you were, were the keynote speaker for the SME live uh, presentation in Topeka, Kansas. Sure. Uh, I've also got to know you through your books. And, and I want to say uh, that understanding more about those brain rules has been a game changer for, for, for me personally. And that's why I want to advocate, be an advocate for you uh, and, and your writings. I know they've been New York Times bestsellers, but you probably wouldn't mind selling a few more books along the way so people can gain this benefit. I'd like to ask you, what inspired you to write Brain Rules for Aging Well? And how does it build on your previous work? Well, it actually has an, the the entire brain rules universe has an as a single origin story, and that would include brain rules for aging well. I was on an airplane. I had just done some consulting over in Atlanta at Emory, and I was taking a red eye back to Seattle. There wasn't a whole lot of people on the airplane. Uh, in fact, there was I was almost the only one back in those days. Um, I read a magazine in the on the airplane that had an extraordinary title. It said "Modern Brain Science." can tell you whether you're going to vote the Democratic ticket or the Republican ticket. It was getting fairly political. And I said to myself, well, I, I do a lot of modern brain science. I've never heard of that. <laughs> There's no way in God's green earth we, we know how what political persuasion you're going to be at by simply looking at how, how your brain is functioning. I threw the magazine across the aisle. That's like I said, there wasn't anybody else there, so it was fine. I was really mad. And I got home and my and I told my wife that. And uh, my dear wife said, Well, John, 
you can sit on your ivory tower on your high haunches and just throw stones at everything. Or you might do something more for the good. What if you just told people what we do know about the brain? As long as we were, hopefully I'm a nice guy, uh, Michael, but I'm a pretty grumpy scientist. Uh, what you can say and what you can't say, and then codify that into a series of uh, um, projects that would have a public face to them. And by golly, she was right. And that's what I did. So the origin story for Brain Rules for Aging Well is the same for all the other in the Brain Rules series. It was an attempt to take a look at what the peer-reviewed real live research, the stuff that I work with every day and and, and also do, um, what that has to say about a particular subject, uh, in this particular case, uh, the aging brain. That's the origin. Wonderful. Wonderful. You know, that, that leads me to the, the, the next question. You know, I, I understand now so much more about brain function and what your research has taught you, but what would be some of the most common misconceptions that people have about aging and brain health? Yeah. Well, oh, we could, I suppose you could take a, a, a giant list. Let's, let's, let's do three. Uh, number one mythology is that it's all over after age 50. <laughs> That's simply Hope not. not true. That's simply not. There are some cognitive gadgets that actually gain in function as you get older. There are some other types of gadgets that actually stay the same and don't erode at all. Um, so the uh, so one of those, interestingly enough, is memory. I know that when you get older, there's a certain uh, memory skill that begins to erode, and it does. But you have 20 or 30 different memory gadgets in the brain. They all work in a semi-independent fashion, and they all age at different rates. And some of them decline, and some of them don't decline at all. You can sometimes tell exactly what's if something is going wrong by simply looking at a memory system. For example, I'm not sure, Michael, you've probably had this experience where you walk down the stairs to retrieve a paper towel, and you get down to the basement to get the paper towel, and you and you think to yourself, "Why am I here?" Because you it only happens it once or twice a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it actually happens to twenty year olds too. It doesn't really matter. In fact, it's called a, the door frame problem because when people seem to pass through the door frame, something happens to their memory. That's more of a joke, but the phenomenon is real, um, and that's fine. That does not particularly erode with age particularly well, but you can tell if an erosion occurs. If you go down the stairs and forget why you were down there to get a paper towel, that's one thing. It's another thing to go downstairs, grab the paper towel, and then wonder where you are and what the towel is for. Now there's an erosion that's begun to occur. So some of them are bellwethers. And so this, to answer the first question, the first mythology is simply that, er that aging is a natural decline. It, it is not. There are some things that stay the same, but there are some things that can erode. And because so many things do stay the same, when there is a delta, when there's a change, when something is occurring, it is sometimes a bellwether to get thee to the neurologist. Wow. Wow. So... <clears throat> You know, in, in the book, you mentioned physical exercise as being such a critical factor for brain health. Yes. Uh, how much exercise do you recommend and maybe what types of exercise uh, is, is best? Yeah. Well, exercise is probably as close to a magic bullet for the aging brain as you're possibly going to get. In fact, the uh, 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 the original research, which, I, which I'll cite, actually came from the aging research itself. It's now known that exercise benefits brains of any age, for sure. But it actually started out in geriatric research by asking the question, there are some people that seem to age like, um, well, I don't know. Do you remember Mike Wallace from 60 Minutes way back when? I do. Yeah. He died at 93, but he was sitting there as a, he was a correspondent for uh, uh, the news magazine 60 Minutes, and he... He would go all around the world, even to his 80s and, and early 90s, just giving hell to all kinds of dictators. <laughs> all he was sharp and he was round and he was available and he aged. I'm going to use the word beautifully. Yeah. He died at 93. Uh, um, there are some people that age more like um, Keith Richards. <laughs> 
Well, he's an amazing story, isn't he? <laughs> well, actually, he is an amazing story. He's actually not a very good example, except if you look at his face. <laughs> then it looks like, okay. And uh, He's emblematic, though. There are people that do not age very well. By the time they're at 65, they don't have near the capacity that Mike Wallace had. And so they're aging poorly. And so the question was asked, what's the difference between Mike Wallace and the people that are not aging very well? We call Mike, by the way, welderlies. That's the formal mm. term. Uh, 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 why, what separates a welderly from everybody else? And the answer turned out to be astonishing. It was the presence or absence of a sedentary lifestyle. Flat out. The more wow. active you were, the more likely uh, physically, a very particular type of activity, which I will address in just a second for sure. The, uh, uh, if you were more active physically, you were much more likely to age like Mike Wallace than you were to age like Keith Richards. Now, given that there's a pharmacological experience between the two men, it's probably different. Nonetheless, the very fact that uh, uh, Mike Wallace actually attributed it to the reason why he stayed so mentally healthy for so long. He had like a three or four walk up in New York and he had to go up and down the stairs all the time. So he oh, felt like okay. environmental stuff. We now know that uh, if you do aerobic exercise on a regular basis, and I'll describe regular in a second, you will improve a gadget called executive function. Executive function is a cognitive gadget that you can sort of think of as a bridge with two pillars on it. One pillar is cognitive control. Part of executive function is cognitive control. That's the ability to attend to something. That's also the ability to shift from a task that you're doing, go back to another task, then shift back and forth and know where you are at all times. It's sometimes referred to as the ability to get things done. There's also the second peer is also an emotional regulation control component. Uh, and this is much more related to impulse control. So people who have anger management problems have real difficulties with their executive function scores. Well, if you become aerobically fit, and you don't even have to be fit, you just have to get off your butt. If you do that, you can actually change your executive function scores by quite a bit. You can see it in the laboratory, and you can see it at any age, and you can especially see it in elderly populations. So. Um, I do have to tell you, Michael, I have to make a confession. I do not want these data to be true. I would just as soon IV a Big Mac as live. <laughs> <laughs> a, while, a while back, and I'm not what you would call aerobically fit. I'm not fit at all. The, uh, but I do walk three miles a day, six days a week. And I will till I'm dead. And the reason why is this. It improves my executive function skills. When you get out there and you're, in the, uh, and you're, and you're busy doing an aerobic workout, and interestingly enough, it's not strengthening exercises that, that, that help the brain. It's aerobic. There's strong reasons when you get older to do strengthening exercises, that's for sure. But if you want to get the, the, uh, a boost in executive function scores, it's not going to get you there at all. You need to walk 150 minutes uh, in a seven-day period of moderate aerobic activity. That's what you need to have. So for most people, it's 30 or 40 minutes a day. Moderate aerobic activity is very interesting. It's just walking too fast to sing. So it's not even a workout, okay? But yeah, it's not like running a marathon. It, it's, it's walking briskly. Yeah, it's not like it's, you're not running at all. Yeah, which is why this is so easy to do for those people that are still ambulatory. You can also get a great aerobic workout in a swimming pool when your joints need support and you no longer can move as effectively as you could. But if you can get that amount of activity, that's nothing, by the way. <laughs> that's just not, which is why I do it. <laughs> well, that's perfect. But in so doing, if you can do that, uh, and you need five days a week. I do six days a week just to... Um, just because I have the I have room in the schedule to do so, uh, that will change your uh, aging brain and uh, make you much more likely to age like a Mike Wallace than age like somebody who's uh, uh, looking like Keith Richards. Yeah. Well, is, is is there too much of a good thing? I mean, what if somebody doubled that? Do you really do you gain much if if you increase that to two hundred or two hundred and fifty minutes a week? Well. Now, that's a really interesting question because it now becomes individualized. Hmm. There are some people that can double it and get a better benefit. There are some people that seem to be born with a ceiling effect. that They can, they can get, they get to a certain level, and then they can't go, even if they exercise more and more and more, they don't ever, ever get past that level. So in some ways, it depends on how well you chose your parents. <laughs> there seems <laughs> well, to be a strong genetic Try to effect. figure out how to choose parents. <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. There's a strong genetic component to the effects of, of aerobic. And it benefits everybody, but exactly how much it, can you double it and get double the effect? Uh, you would call that, you're titrating it at this point. You're looking for a dose-dependent change. Uh, that's not true in this literature. It's, it, it seems to be all over the map. For some people, yeah. yeah, thank you for that. Now, I, I also understand that sleep plays a vital role in, in brain health. Are there any unique challenges to a an older person such as myself? I just turned 66 this last summer. Uh, I don't sleep as well as I used to. Um, yeah. So what kind of a role does this play? And is there anything I can do to improve that? Yeah, well, I'm 68. I'll be 69 in two months. So amen, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> The good news is that there's tons. The bad news is that sleep really does change as you get older. It's not as easy for you to get to sleep. You still need the same amount. You could argue maybe sometimes you need more because you're more vulnerable to infections as you get older. And, you know, and if you, the more sleep you can get, regular sleep you can get, the better you're potentiating your immune system. There's all kinds of things that can happen. But the good news is that, yes, there is. There's tons you can do. But you have to begin instituting a program of what I'll call sleep hygiene and sleep hygiene. If you really want to get to bed, what time do you normally go to bed, Michael? What, what, what oh, 930. 930 10, yeah, yeah. Ish. If, yeah. If you want to go to bed around 930 or 10, you start preparing for it at three o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, I'm not making that up. You start preparing for it at three o'clock in the afternoon, particularly if insomnia has come on you and it's now beginning to interfere with your productivity. Uh, if, if you're doing the normal aging stuff and you can live with it, uh, uh, you don't have to be as rigorous, but most people don't pay attention to their sleep hygiene and to their peril because sleep deprivation has been shown to be a risk factor for dementia. <laughs> so one of the ways to buffer against dementia is to start paying attention to three o'clock in the afternoon. No more coffee. Okay. Done. Finished. No more diet Coke or Coke or whatever caffeine that you're going to be having. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You need to begin preparing the room you're going to go to sleep in for sleep habitation. So you're, you'll first of all have to have a room where you can do this. But for most people, light sensitivity is such a big thing. Sure. You have heavy curtains that you can move. You want sound isolation if you can. Some people go to uh, uh, respond really well to white noise. Some people don't. But in your sleep room, which you're now going to call the bedroom is now going to be your sleep laboratory. Okay, where you can do some experimenting, um, you're going to have a closed environment. You're going to get it so that so that the, the ambient temperature is at about 66 to 68 degrees tops. The uh, the uh, body, uh, the brain pays a ton of attention to core body temperature, and it's supposed to uh, decrease as as you begin to drift into sleep. And then you begin doing what what I would just call sleep exercises, uh, maybe an hour or so before you go to bed, if you want to be serious about this, where you begin to calm down and you begin to read calming things. No more right of spring for a little while. Instead, we're going to go to uh, maybe some Ravel <laughs> for a little while or, or fill a glass if you really want to get sick. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, and uh, so that's, well, that's one thing. Also at about the three o'clock mark, it's extraordinarily important that, especially as you get older, you begin paying attention to a nap, a daily nap. It's good for just about everybody, but it's especially important for uh, people as they age. Um, you need to take a nap. Sleep is defined. There, there are two giant biochemical behavioral forces that work in your brain. It's called the opponent process model. One side is called the circadian arousal system. It's gadgets within the brain that's just trying to keep you awake all the time. And it is the sworn enemy of, uh, of another system called the homeostatic sleep drive, which is trying to put you to sleep. At the point where they cross, these are graphs, these are biphasic curves that, that go, one goes up and one's going down. At the point where they cross, the brain is sitting there going, oh man, when am I going to go to sleep? Or am I going to stay awake? Which system am I supposed to pay attention to? And it's such a taxing thing that the brain would actually like you to shut down for a little while Why? while it makes up its mind about what it's going to do. And the best way to do that is to take a nap. Hmm. 26 minutes in length. You don't even have to go to sleep. You just have to be in the prone or supine position, something where the gyroscope has changed because when the gyroscope changes, uh, the brain is most of the time when we have an activity that requires us to lay down in a horizontal position, it's because we're going to go to sleep. The brain knows that. 
And so if it sees that something is beginning to happen, oh, oh I'm now in a prone or supine position. Maybe my boss wants me to go to sleep. Take a 26-minute nap, and I'll tell you how to calculate it. And the answer to the answer to the question is you need to take a nap to get your sleep hygiene going. Here's how you calculate it. Most people need to take a nap 12 hours past the midpoint of their previous night's sleep. So that at 12 hours past the midpoint of their previous night's sleep. So if you went to bed at midnight, and for some reason you got up at 6 in the morning, the midpoint is 3 a.m. Wind that out 12 hours, it's now 3 p.m., boom, take your nap there. So that's another part of the sleep hygiene. The last part of the sleep hygiene, sorry, I just got into a monologue here, Michael. It's okay. <laughs> sorry about that, I'm buddy. learning. I'm learning more. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last thing to pay attention to, if you need to have a sleep room, for sure, so you have to pay attention at 3 o'clock in the morning, you need to take a nap. The third and final thing I would suggest is pay attention, and most people actually don't know this because they don't pay attention to it until they, until they get insomnia. Pay attention to what we call a chronotype. You have a chronotype. This is genetically wired into you about when to wake up and when to go to sleep. There are people that are genetically wired. We call them early chronotypes. Actually, we call them larks. And if they had their druthers, they would wake up at 6.30 in the morning every morning, and they would go to bed at 9.30 every night, and they will report that their most uh, cognitively robust experiences, the time when they feel like they're most on their game, when they're most, when the brain is most alive, is in the morning. And if we measure them, by golly, they're right. They actually are peaking at noon, but they feel the acceleration up into the peak. And so they feel like they're at their most aroused, their most creative, their best, their best worth it. We call them morning persons, larks or early chronotype. And they are the sworn enemy, Michael, of another 20% of the population, <laughs> who I swear all are jazz musicians. <laughs> <laughs> if they had their druthers and could disengage from life, they would not go to bed until three o'clock in the morning. Oh my. And they would not get up before 1130 the next morning. They report that their most cognitively robust periods, the time when they feel the most alive, the most creative is at night. And if we measure them, Michael, by golly, they're right. It's oh, wow. it, they peak at midnight. And they're, and they're accelerating up into it, just like the earliest did. We call them owls. No surprise. We call them late chronotypes. And that is genetically wired to them. So one of the things that you have to ask, especially as you get older and are thinking about retirement, is what kind of chronotype am I? Because that has followed you all your life. By the way, we live in an early chronotype society. Our, works, our work in school starts in the morning and ends. But about 20% of the population, about one in five, uh, uh, are at odds, are at war with their society because they know darn well that they're night owls. And oh. if they figure out a way, we, we see this in kids uh, uh, graduating in school uh, uh, who they're late chronotypes. They've been dragging a sleep debt around them like I don't know, Jacob Marley drags his his chains around him in Christmas Carol. Uh, they've done it all their life. They've dragged a sleep debt all their life. And we can, and maybe they're a B or a C student. And when they get into college and all of a sudden can start taking classes that are in, at night, that are more con, uh, congruent with their chronotype, all of a sudden their grades soar. And some people would say, oh, they're just late bloomers. And the neuroscientists in the room are kind of chuckling because they say, no, they're just finally chronotype congruent for the first time in their life. Yeah. So if you are a person who is aging and you're worried about sleep, you need to know about your chronotype. And you need to know if you were a later or early, you need to be, start paying attention to it and start finally, now that you're in retirement, carving your day in such fashion that you can finally be congruent with what the genes gave you when you were born. Oh, that's, it's great news. And I, I'm now realizing for the first time, I am the first type you uh, described, the large. Are you early? Yeah. Uh, early. Yeah. And fortunately, my wife, Nancy, is similar. Uh -huh. So we're, we're not op at odds uh, with that one. So yeah. I'm gonna, I am going to change that habit. It's the one brain rule that I have not been following on a religious basis. So I'm going to, I'm going to make that uh, change uh, real quick. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what I'd also like to know, and uh, this is, 
This is based on some conversation we had uh, back in Topeka a couple of years ago. I'm really curious to know how can learning new skills or hobbies help protect our brains? Uh, oh, boy. You know, if you read through the book Brain Rules for Aging Well, one of the f- last parts of the chapter has a, almost an edict. Thou shalt not retire. thou shalt change into something you like to do but thou shalt not retire one of the reasons why is that you in order for your brain to stay active and to keep active you've got to continually exercise it it really is i often don't like to use the word uh, the analogy of a muscle and nerve tissue together because they don't but here it applies beautifully the more you exercise your brain, the more you are involved in, in, in other things, the uh, more likely it is to stay healthy. But other things in a very particular direction, it's, it's other things that usually involve someone else or ideas that are bigger than you. <laughs> the, uh, the research suggests that the more you can engage in something that's called social decentering, which is where you just get off the block and you're not trying to think of your own aches and pains and your own desires and your own wants, but you're thinking of somebody else's aches and pains and desires and wants. It's called social decentering for a reason. You, you are getting off the throne. This also works with the world of ideas. One thing that I do routinely is that I have a, an app for the James Webb Telescope where they're always uh, downloading the latest pictures. And when you see the magnificence of the universe and you see the powerful uh, ideas that that machine is uncovering for us so we can see these vast distances and you sometimes feel so small and sometimes you just feel in awe and in gratitude because you are not focusing on yourself and your own aches and pains. When I see those pictures, I'm lost for a period of time. Uh, it is uh, it is astonishing to say to you, to you and to me and to all of us, the more you do that, the healthier your brain becomes. So the more you can be involved in things that are not your arthritis <laughs> or wondering yeah. if it depends or not. If you're not focusing on the things that are that are immediately uh, uh, afflicting yourself, but are instead looking outward, not to deny that you need your medical care and all the things you need to do to stay healthy aging. Otherwise, if you're in a lot of pain, you're not going to be wanting to look at the James Webb telescope. That's for sure. But given all other things equal, being able to do that is a very powerful thing. Um, there's a second uh, component to this idea that's really strong. If you can, especially as you get older, Start interacting with people that are 30 or 40 years younger than you are. Maybe even that are 50 or 60 years younger than yours. You're looking at little kids. The reason why is because they're so not like you. (laughs) And they're so other than you. (laughs) You just have to do all kinds of exercises in the mental gym to keep up with them. (laughs) And that stimulation, it's a little bit like opening up a calculus book if you've never had calculus. But instead of calculus, you're opening up a relationship with someone who is not you but does the same darn thing. So that I, I've regularly encouraged, and I've been on a couple of advising, when I, as, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm a consultant. Uh, when I consult, I regularly suggest uh, uh, skilled uh, nursing facilities or just, just your standard uh, nursing home that they put it right up against a preschool and then have, particularly if there were teachers that were involved that in their in their working life were actually involved in the education system that they go down there and they teach these preschoolers these kids so that they get involved in their lives and they get and they get excited about what they're doing the more intergenerational interactions you can have the research literature shows the better your brain becomes literally uh, uh, Michael human relationships are vitamins oh that's wonderful yeah that's wonderful. Well, you know, staying active and, you know, we talked about the retirement thing. I did retire from my full-time profession as a sales director in June of last year. Uh, And I I have to say that first I was a little lost in, in, in that, you know, Um, however, you know, I've been working on my music for the last decade Uh, and I can now proudly say I can now proudly say that I can actually afford to be a full-time musician. Uh, It doesn't pay very well, (laughs) you know, but I enjoy it immensely. And I think the biggest surprise to me is that after I retired, I was finally able to memorize 
more than 30 cover songs that I would do. And I didn't think I'd ever be able to accomplish that. I just thought my brain was too old. uh, It was too full or something. But I struggled with that during my working years. Now with a little less stress and more time, uh, more physical activity, I I accomplished something I didn't think was ever possible. Is is there any science behind that? Or, or, Or is that just, was I just lucky? Oh, there's tons of science behind it. Uh, uh, I remember our conversations about being fans of the Wichita linemen. I call the Wichita linemen fan club. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some of us who just think that song is the best thing ever made. Oh, I, 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 I still love that song. Yes. Oh, and I'm mostly a Stravinsky and neoclassicist Prokofiev and Oscar Peterson freak. But when I hear that, I come online. Yeah. Um, what you described and your love affair with Glenn, all things Glenn Campbell, maybe I certainly am. The uh, yep. uh, um, um, you described something that is well represented in the literature, and let's go through that. Um, you said some magic words. You said you were in sales for a long time, and, and uh, uh, my guess is because your people skills are so darn good. My guess is you were really good at it. The uh, all I love sudden, people. <laughs> yeah, you do. You do, and it shows, Michael, which is. One of the reasons why I consented to, to talk to you again. I'm happy to. I'm, ha- I'm, I'm happy for the invitation. The uh, um, um, people that are involved that are involved in enriched activities like that, once they once they retire, if they've not planned for it at all, go into free fall for a little bit. It's, they just go down. They don't. Their their day isn't structured anymore. They're not quite sure what it is that they're to do. And in the research literature, the risk for anxiety and depressive disorders just goes sky high. Um, and it's because the transition is so great. One of the reasons why I say thou shalt not retire, I do mean it, but I do mean it with some clarity. When, If you know the day that you're going to retire, say you know you're going to retire within the year or something like mm-hmm. that, so everybody's planning the party. For that year, you begin planning for what you're going to do the week after you have disengaged from your job. So that nothing is a surprise. You have structure that you can immediately go into and you have already started working on it. You can sort of think of it as handing off a baton, you know, where the runners are running and once one one is running and the other starts to make pace with them. And then eventually they're running at the same then grabs the baton. That's the idea. You want very much to have, most people don't plan it. It's the same thing with sleep. Most people don't plan their sleep either and yet it bugs people. (laughs) <laughs> so this depression and anxiety for the change can also bug people. But the fact that you landed onto something now that you loved and that you can do and that you can do full time says that the scaffolding that you had in place is working. If you could have done that, say, a year and a half earlier, maybe it would have been a little easier on you. I don't know specific circumstance. I know some people and I've actually talked to them who uh, who just didn't plan a darn thing. They just thought it would be a get out of jail free card and they were going to be fine. And they were getting cranky and no one wanted to be around them. And mm-hmm. they would they were, of course, not being invited to meetings and, you know, and uh, uh, conferences and stuff anymore of things they used to go to, which is a normal part of that job. But it's because they had nothing else to go to that they felt they were in free fall. And That's- so, so the advice is very clear. And to answer your question, yeah, there's a strong research literature about this. Thou shalt not retire, but by golly, you ought to plan for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I will say it, it, it's going really well now. And I, I, I believe that you talk in your book about many of the health benefits of music, in particular, the, the reminiscing. And I, I understand you have a favorite song to reminisce to uh would you mind sharing that with the audience oh i have several <laughs> but i think you're probably talking about the one my wife and i share yes it was by the little river band and it's one called, of my favorites of all um, time oh i love i love i love it so much hurry don't be late i can hardly wait Oh, that's I, I get teary eyed with it. The uh, my, my wife and I have heard that forever. I mean, it was ni- we got married, I think, in 1981. It was the Little River Band was hitting in 1978, 79. They also had um, Have You the Lonesome Loser, I think, is was mm-hmm. another one of their hits. 
the uh, uh, um, but that song became our song, and it's a reminiscence bump uh, for us. And we right when whenever we hear it, we get all misty eyed, and that's just that's just kind of our song. And it's all about uh, all about reminiscing to music. You know, hey, Glenn Miller's band was better than before. For those of you in the audience who have no idea what I'm talking about, go get this thing. It's well constructed song. It's well it's well produced, uh, and it's got a message that'll just get you right between the eyes. The, uh, uh, and I say that as a person who really is more into jazz and classical music than than uh, uh, what I sometimes consider pop confection. This is no confection. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I will I will be posting that particular song on my website. Right. Uh, I am a, a, a junkie when it comes to YouTube. Uh, right. It's a it's a free source for great music that you might not hear on the radio today. And I would say, you know, unless you're listening to an oldie station, you're probably not going to hear any of the Little River Band's uh, right. material uh, because it all is from a bygone era, uh, which, which well, leads me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's a Sorry, perfect man. fit, <laughs> you know, but what I'd like to ask is, you know, kind of what's, what's going on? What, what happens in our brain when we hear one of those songs that we so dearly loved, perhaps during our teenage years or uh, maybe even into our 20s, what, what's going on in our brains when we hear those? Well, let's get into it. Let's talk about the power of nostalgia and then specifically the power of nostalgia and music. The, uh, um, it was thought for a long time in the research world that nostalgia, which I think means bad air or something close to it, was a negative. That when you looked back, that that you were just looking backwards, and you're going to sunset boulevard your life, and yeah. then soon there's, you know, you don't have any anything left because you're not dealing. And in American culture, which is really a forward looking culture, you know, we just won three quarters of all the Nobel prizes last week. The uh, we are 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 forward facing. These things have all affected our futures. We are, are we are a young culture. Uh, we're a young country compared to say, um, I don't know, Egypt. <laughs> sure <laughs> you know it's like we're like we're so we're used to so it's not in necessarily in our cultural dna to look backwards and think that that's positive but that's why you have to do the experiments michael and when you do the experiments you see something amazing nostalgia is a little bit like exercise they're both act like vitamins for the brain, particularly if you do it correctly. And so let's talk about the vitamins and then talk about uh, specifically uh, um, uh, uh, music. We now know that if you start uh, waxing nostalgic in a very particular time period, your social connectedness scores go up, which is your ability not only to have friends, but to engage with friends. The number of positive memories begins to go up. We have a positive memory bias anyway. But the more you are nostalgic over some of those, the more you begin uh, eliciting uh, uh, positive feelings that are going. Death-related anxiety decreases with nostalgia. So as you get older and you know that you're going to be facing eventually the, you know, the, the day that you will no longer be here, you're not as worried about that as much. And I think what's most interesting is that as you become more nostalgic, your tolerance for outsiders greatly increases, especially those with social differences from you, which is the hardest part. It's the hardest one. Nostalgia, it appears to be really, really good for the brain if you do it in a particular way. So we'll talk about that particular in a second. Um, the second large component, that's the behavioral work. There's also a biochemical component. Researchers found that because the behavioral was so strong, when you reminisce, people get smiles on their faces. Mm -hmm. It's called kumbaya. The, uh, um, that uh, it looked like people were happier. So they measured dopamine levels. And by golly, when people become nostalgic, uh, what we call the highway to we call it the highway to hell. Actually, <laughs> there's an area that is a little it's about the size of a paperclip uh, nucleus accumbens to the ventral tegmental area. I know I just said a bunch of jargon. The uh, just think of it as the the place where dopamine lollipops occur. <laughs> and you, when you get nostalgia, you lick on that, and it just comes right up. We now know that nostalgia boosts dopamine. And that's key, not only because dopamine is not also involved in your rewards and feelings of pleasure, it's also involved in your motor skills, hmm. right? A, last, a lack of dopamine has a particular name, which is called Parkinson's disease. So it has a strong uh, motor component to it. In fact, people that have become nostalgic actually improve, uh, that you get them into nostalgia, improves their motor skills, uh, their motor skills. Okay. Also, memory goes up, mostly because hmm. you're 
visiting things. Uh, so it looks like nostalgia was going to be really, really powerful in such power that people started to ask the question, well, if that's the case, uh, how should you become nostalgic and what should you get nostalgic? And here's where we can get into the music. And I'll start with an example of a song I actually hate. But when I heard it, I got a nostalgia bump so big, I thought to myself, Medina, you hate this song. <laughs> the song is a phone number, 8675309. That's by Tommy Tutone, I think. <laughs> and do you remember it? Jimmy, Jimmy, who could I turn? I still hate that song. Eight, six. Why I remember it is because it's the, the song is three minutes, 45 minutes in length. They repeat that phone number 29 times. <laughs> <laughs> if you remember it. And I hate this song, but the nostalgia, but, but it occurred within nostalgia. And I thought to myself, now I love this song. What is going up with this? Well, we now know what's going up with it. We now know the particular type of nostalgia that you should be involved in, or at least that you, you have a better memory for. Here it is. You remember best everything that happened to you best between the ages of 15 and 29. Okay. This was actually done with 80-year-olds originally, where they had to assay a bunch of... I talked about this at the SME. The, uh, uh, it's called a reminiscence bump. The, uh, um, and if you, if you ask somebody to do a gross domestic product over all of their memories for their whole life, they remember best the sheer number of memories and the ordinal. The, by that, I mean the order in which they occur, the sequence of events. Best between the ages of 15 and 29, almost as if your brain just becomes alive. The best books you ever read, you read between 15 and 29. Your political points of view and religious points of view were shaped mostly with, between the ages of 15 and 29, either reacting towards your uh, how you were raised or against. Uh, the best movies you ever saw, and most importantly, the best music you ever heard. You heard between 15 and 29 of those. And the reason why that's I, I put a circle around the music is that it, this actually has a business antecedent in the research literature, because a, music executives before the age of Spotify and streaming mm -hmm. were really concerned about the fact that after age 30, people stopped buying new records. Had all the good ones, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, because not, and every generation does this. After age 30, they stop buying new records because the music isn't good enough. Right. <laughs> it's not as good as what we had in the back. You know, Billy Eilish has got nothing on Pink Floyd. Okay. <laughs> what is this Taylor Swift compared to Linda Ronstadt, right? I mean, it just, yeah. it's, it can go on and on and on about it. But uh, if you can get, and here's where, this is how you reminisce. I actually uh, recommend that everybody set up a room if they can and fill it all, particularly with music. Now we'll, we'll get started on the music in a second. The uh, um, fill a room that is your nostalgia room. I'm going to call it your dopamine agonist room because that's actually what it is. Or dopamine boosting room, better way to say it, sorry. Boost, uh, uh, um, fill it with everything that happened to you between the ages of 15 and 29. Fill it with the smells you smelled back then. Get the big books that you read and haven't read in a long, long time. Put those in there and start reading them. The uh, uh, Get the best colors, the best posters, all the stuff. And most importantly, the best music that you think that you heard between those times. That gives you the strongest reminiscence bump. So powerful it is that there's actually the literature actually has a very powerful, very wonderful emblem associated with it. Did you ever see the little documentary called Alive Inside? Have you ever heard that before? If it if it's referring to Dr. Sachs, uh, some of his research, perhaps. And I know that I watched one on YouTube. Uh, it was about Henry, who was an Alzheimer's patient in a nursing home. And, you know, I've actually seen that play out live when I'm performing yeah, yeah. in front of a group of seniors that maybe have some form of memory loss, dementia, Alzheimer's uh, disease. And they, they seem to just come to life in front of my eyes. Oh, well, then by all means, if you can provide a link to it, it's called Alive Inside. Henry Dreyer is his name. Uh, Oliver Sacks comments on it, but it wasn't, it was actually Henry's daughter that actually did this. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll set the stage for it. Uh, but it so shows why you should have a nostalgia room. Michael, you and I both should have nostalgia rooms for our respective times when we were between 15 and 29, and then go visit them regularly because hurry, don't be late, we'll come on and all will be well. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Here's here's what happened. Henry is a. They weren't sure what he had. It looks like he had a dementia of some kind. Uh, what he was was sometimes called a shut in or a or a shrivel. The uh, there, he was in a wheelchair. He's gnarled and he's just sitting there and he's not doing very much except all, uh, sort of existing. But turns out. He actually he was a musician apparently uh, not not professional but amateur. oh okay yeah and I didn't know that yeah, either uh, but he had a love affair with Cap Calloway which for his age was right in his fifteen to twenty nine yep. uh, reminiscence book so what happens is that his daughter in those days you're going to see those old Apple iPods <laughs> puts those phones on him and just presses the play button it's filled with Cap Calloway. And you watch this guy unfold like you were watching the movie Cocoon or watching a sunflower react to the sun. He unfolds. His motor, his, the, his muscle tenor begins to change. He looks up and he stares like somebody had hit him over the head and he gets really wide-eyed. And yeah. then you hear him. He, he starts to vocalize. Yes. He starts to sing with it and he starts to go in cadence. And all of a sudden you see, that's why it's called Alive Inside. Music reached down into this man and shook him. <laughs> it said, wake up. You're not dead yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and th it, this is also true in the literature that you see. When you, when you see nostalgia work that way, and music is such a powerful way, which is why it's such a, a great emblem for, for it. If you'll notice afterward, he had about a three hour tail. By that, I mean the bump was still available because when he's finished, he looks right at the camera. He starts giving advice about why you should live a good life and uh, cherish the moment and all of the kinds of things you wouldn't expect anybody who is shriveled like this to even have a cognitive uh, awareness of. And so for three hours, he had this very powerful experience. That is exactly what the research literature shows. So to answer your question, yeah, and music is, is, is easily at the vanguard of this. But all of the things that you were exposed to between 15 and 29, you ought to, become, you ought to reacquaint yourself with. Well, I put that to practice. Oh, did, uh, what happened? And, and what I learned is, is this. I, I've written quite a bit of original music, which would be new to the listener. Uh -huh. And I, uh, sad to say, it failed miserably if I would open a set with an original song. Sure. Sure. But what I learned is if I would connect with the audience with at least a half a dozen songs that would be from their prime era, then I could tell a story and introduce them to something new and they would buy into it. It was like magic. Like what I'd be curious is, so what's the science behind that? And you know, what, what might people in marketing or sales want to, want to know about how to make that connection? And why, why, is it, why does it work? Well, we think we know. Oddly enough, and I say that as a really grumpy scientist who regularly boosts people for believing in mythologies. Um, you might recall that one of the things that happens when you become nostalgic is that your social connectedness score goes up. What that means is that you become more willing to engage in a relationship with someone who is the source of the nostalgia or with the product, to answer your question about marketing, that is that is giving this to you. Or the uh, idea of it all by itself, you have a positive, warm feeling. And when you have a warm feeling like that, the brain always interprets that as safety, oh. psychological safety. Yes, this product will work. It will give me what I need. This This man who's singing in front of me, I'm going to listen to something that I've never heard before because I feel safe with him because I heard something I did know before. So when dopamine is flooding into the system and you're beginning to, to move in it, uh, uh, you are communicating feelings of safety, which us usually acts like you can sort of think of it as the friendly door person in front of an apartment. <laughs> you know, if they, if, you, if they greet you by your name because they know you, you will yeah. feel safe. Same idea. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, as as I suspected, Doctor Medina, uh, I over prepared with questions, <laughs> and that's okay. I maybe I can. On maybe I while. can. Maybe I can have you back again at at some point in time. We can expand on the conversation. Sure. But I know that the listeners to this, 
can get a lot of value out of purchasing one or more of your books. I know you have a whole series. My youngest daughter just recently bought the book. It was something brain rules, I believe, for babies. Does that sound uh, like the the, the the correct title? I know I personally um, gravitated to brain rules for aging well, you know, especially you know, especially following, you know, our conversation uh, that we had. Uh, and what, I, what I'd like to make sure that you have a, an opportunity to respond to is this question. So what would you say would be the most important takeaway that you hope a reader gains from Brain Rules for Aging Well? Oh, that's really simple. Relationships are everything. Don't cut them off. Engage them. Get new ones. Uh, aid and abet pre-existing ones. There's not much time left when you're older. You can actually see you sometimes in the back nine, sometimes in the last four or five holes. You'll take your pick of the metaphors. Last two minutes of the, of the final quarter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. At the end of the day, it was only ever about relationships. The research literature shows that. I can resonate with it in my heart. I can sense that you see it too. Relationships are so important that being able to incorporate, and maybe even sometimes if you're a little rough around the edges and as you get older, you know where your rough edges are, why don't you sand those back so that you can entertain relationships with people you might not have had a strong relationship with in times past? Because at the end of the day, the most important thing any of us do from a survival perspective is that we have each other. And from purely an emotional, spiritual, uh, uh, biological point of view, we need each other like a son of a gun. Don't neglect them. That's the most important thing. In fact, Brain Rules for Aging could be just summarized uh, 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 with, a, with, a, with a quip. Be a friend and have many. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I advocate that everywhere I go, be a friend to others and let others be a friend to you. And that's a direct quote from your book. I didn't come up with that one. Uh, Dr. Medina, this has been just a real pleasure for me. I want to thank you again for being our guest today. I want to encourage any and all that have listened to this podcast to go out and purchase the book, go to your local library, see if you can check it out. And I, I know a real bargain is, I believe it's called Libro uh -huh. uh, FM, which is a an app you can purchase. And I don't know if it's still that same price, but I believe I only paid four dollars and change uh -huh. uh, for the 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 audio version, which you actually narrated so folks i'm telling you this is this is golden uh i cannot think of anything that would be better for a senior but i i don't want to exclude our younger listeners because i i, I seem to remember that you said our brains tend to start declining maybe in our late 20s so there you're never too young to learn what brain rules can really make a difference for you personally. So I'd like to encourage all of you to dig in to Dr. Medina's research. Learn firsthand because it's been a game changer for me personally, Dr. Medina, and I want to thank you for that. Well, thank you very much for the invitation, Michael. And it's once again, good to break bread with you and be a, a, a card-carrying member of the Wichita Lineman Fan Club. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I hope one of these days uh, we're able to connect for that cup of coffee in oh, Seattle. Yeah. Love that city. And as always, I enjoy talking with you. Thanks again, Dr. Medina, for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks again for the invitation, Mike. Santa Fe Black, Santa Fe Black. Reflecting.